So w what I'm going to do is, uh, in the 30 minutes uh, I have, I'm going to try to, uh, instead of having a, a very broad overview of myeloma, I'm just going to uh, point to a few uh, pieces of recent data, essentially uh, with newer agents. But as I do that, I was trying to frame where that is positioned into some evolving paradigms in multiple myeloma. I think uh, the last decade uh, was uh, marked by not only the presence of newer agents, but also how we approach multiple myeloma, how we think of myeloma in terms of treatment paradigm and treatment goals in general. So I'm going to talk essentially, uh, this is my disclosures, and I'm going to talk about some drugs uh, made by those uh, companies so those become relevant. So I'm going to talk about new protosome inhibitors, I'm going to talk about monoclonal antibodies, and uh, last I'm going to talk about uh, HDAC inhibitors. Um, so uh, we essentially coming from a scenario that until uh, a couple years ago we had only one protosome inhibitor available, which is bortezomib, but that's really has uh, changed the scenario uh, uh, quite a bit uh, into multiple myeloma, both for uh, transplant eligible and non-transplant eligible patient. Um, uh, just a couple years ago, we got approval of carfilzomib. I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, recent data on carfilzomib. But this is uh, data on exazomib, I think is one of the uh, next ones to uh, emit uh, protosome inhibitors to come alive. So this is the um, exazomib and um, I hope the millennium people don't hear me, but this is subcutaneous bortezomib on a pill. Uh, it's, a, it's a proteasome inhibitor with a very similar uh, structure um, that bortezomib, so essentially you're acting on the same proteases that bortezomib does, which is in this regard different from carfilzomib, which you have a, a different uh, array of proteases that are affected. But it has uh, a, a chemical composition that makes it uh, bioavailable Therefore, it can be taken as a pill. And the assumption here is, in a way, similar to subcutaneous bortezomib, you have a different uh, you know, peak duration uh, distribution than you have with IV drug, which would uh, hopefully allow for effective proteasome inhibition without much of the toxicity, particularly neurotoxicity. So this is a phase uh, two trial, uh, which has really laid the ground for subsequent phase three trials, um, where uh, exazomib uh, on a weekly dose was parallel with a backbone of lenalidomide dexamethasone. And patients could have up to 12 cycles of therapy, both you know, transplant eligible and transplant ineligible patients. And um, they could collect cells after three cycles, they could go to transplant after six cycles, or patients could choose not to go to transplant, they had the option to go into a maintenance regimen. So this is a, a distribution of the patients and uh, we, I think it is, is, uh, is a problem that is not unique to myeloma, but we see, um, but I think is uh, uh, not unique, but certainly uh, hurtful in multiple myeloma. We tend to see an underrepresentation of the older, underrepresentation of the sicker. So in a disease that a third of the people have renal failure, everybody here had good kidneys, very few um, uh, ISS uh, stage three, and mostly young patients. Nevertheless, the VGPR uh, plus uh, CR that was the primary endpoint, 60% uh, with an overall response rate in the neighborhood of 90%. So that's not dissimilar to what we see with uh, other triplets where bortezomib is uh, part of the backbone. Uh, the point that was made here, and uh, here's where I would evoke one of the changing paradigms in multiple myeloma is, uh, of course the patients who went to transplant are not analyzed here, but the patients who stay on maintenance therapy or stay on exazomib as part of the maintenance, about half of those patients had an upgrading response rate uh, uh, going from you know, PR to CR or CR to, to, to uh, or VGPR to CR uh, or CR to restringent CR. So um, again, this has been showing over and over and over and over again that duration of therapy matter, um, it kind of moves away from the old paradigm of the fixed duration therapy followed by observation to perhaps a more aggressive, intense induction followed by some sort of maintenance or continuous therapy uh, to prevent disease recurrence. In terms of side effect profile, uh, not very uh, different from what we see, uh, again, with subcutaneous weekly bortezomib, um, uh, essentially some diarrhea, some fatigue, some nausea, uh, very uh, relatively uh, little uh, peripheral neuropathy, and most of those cases were non-severe peripheral neuropathy.
So um, exazomib is now uh, being uh, tested in, in phase three trials, both for upfront non-transplant eligible patients, also in the relapse setting, and also its uh, upcoming trial with exazomib being tested as maintenance therapy after autologous transplant. Uh, so that, that is uh, not yet an available agent. Uh, Carfuzomib, on the other hand, is an available agent, uh, initially approved for uh, relapse uh, patients that hadn't received pribortezomib and pralinolidomide therapy. <laughs> and this uh, was uh, perhaps the largest, uh, uh, for sure the largest uh, completed study on Carfuzomib, one of the few that are randomized. Um, and this, I think, is a uh, practice change. Uh, it's one of the few things I'm gonna show today that is ready to go practice change. So this is the ASPAR trial, or randomization between lenalidomide and dexamethasone, and lenalidomide, dexamethasone, and carfuzomib for patients who had relapsed multiple myeloma after uh, one or more lines of therapy. So the primary endpoint uh, was progression for survival and all the uh, typical uh, secondary endpoints. And I would praise this trial for having a qual of life endpoint, which is something that is, we need to uh, start demanding uh, but it's still uh, very uncommonly seen uh, reported in clinical trials. So pre-inclusion criteria, which had one to three uh, prior regimens, and of course, because lenalidomide was the control arm, uh, patients were not allowed to, ha to have, of course, lenalidomide refractory uh, disease. So they had to, if they had received pralinolidomide, they had to have uh, lenalidomide-sensitive disease, not have had a progression lenalidomide. So this is the, the treatment, so the, the backbone that we all used to with the once a weekly dexamethasone and lenalidomide 21 or 28 days, and carfilzomib in the traditional label uh, is scheduling with uh, 20 milligrams on the first uh, couple of days on the first cycle, and then 27 milligrams essentially twice a week, three weeks out of four. Um, again, uh, the patient uh, uh, population, um, uh, no, no great dissimilarity. Again, those uh, uh, typical restrictions that we have to uh, pay attention when we look at clinical trials. You know, everybody here had a, a decent uh, kidney function. <laughs> uh, few patients with uh, peripheral neuropathy at baseline. Uh, this couldn't be more than grade, uh, grade one without pain. Uh, so, of course, patients who had advanced neuropathy were not eligible. But the thing I want to highlight is prior therapy. So, that's a relatively uh, quite uh, highly treated uh, population. Major of patients had bortezomib, um, and including a subset of patients who were bortezomib uh, refractory. Um, and about a third of the patients had had both bortezomib and lenalidomide, which we uh, are used to thinking as the two main drugs in multiple myeloma. So this is the primary endpoint, and this was presented um, at ASH and simultaneously published at New England Journal of Medicine. So the trial reached its primary endpoint, which had improved in progression free survival by almost uh, 10 months uh, between RD and uh, KRD. Um, and this is one of the se uh, key secondary endpoints, with, which is objective response, uh, more stringent CRs, uh, more uh, VGPRs are better, and more overall response rate. So 90% of response rate in a relapsed uh, population is uh, quite uh, formidable. Uh, in terms of overall survival, uh, this might be a little bit misleading um, because it seems significant, although this is one-sided. Uh, by the way, the, the, the journal did not go with it, two-sided p-value 0.04. But this did not, did not cross the barrier uh, for significance for an entering analysis. So I don't think we can claim that this triplet uh, change overall survived, at least not quite yet. Um, what I think was uh, more important here, uh, and I think we've got to keep that in mind when you look at the, uh, at the Panabinostat date later, uh, is we've got to uh, think of the magnitude of benefit versus the increase in toxicity. And this was uh, a nine-month improvement in progression for survival. When we went on toxicity, uh, of, we would, I think we'd, I would expect some uh, added toxicity to KRD, KRD, and that indeed happens, but not to the great magnitude. So you can see here a little bit more diarrhea. Uh, I mean, of course, there's no comparisons here, but uh, a few kind of hard to explain things, a few more respiratory infection. But the things that we're all looking forward to is uh, dyspnea and peripheral neuropathy, and those don't seem any different. Uh, here, frank heart failure also not different between, uh, between uh, the two arms. Um, and uh, again, I will praise the trial again for reporting um, uh, 
a patient report of quality of life with improvement in carfilzomib group versus the control group. So to me, I think this is uh, quite uh, convincing, uh, convincing um, uh, uh, study, uh, and I think ch uh, helps to um, challenge some paradigms. I think we all grew up thinking myeloma as uh, little therapy, one to two drugs at a time, uh, in uh, using a sequential matter. Um, uh, and this, I think, uh, very well, uh, perhaps better than any trial before, uh, shows the benefit of using a triplet uh, in the relapse setting. I think we have seen a lot of triplets being used up front, uh, but I think this helps consolidate the role of triple therapy uh, in relapse patients. Um, moving on along, I think uh, uh, th that's the, the most enthusiasm uh, in the field of myeloma now is in monoclonal antibodies. Uh, and this has been called uh, the greatest irony of multiple myeloma, which is the cancer that makes antibodies has not yet had an effective antibody therapy. Um, I think uh, if you were in, in groups of myeloma doctors four or, five, or, or three years ago, and you pull the group on what is the most exciting upcoming agent in myeloma, you have a you know, 25 items list uh, with no clear winning. And if you do the same pool uh, today, I think you got near 100% of, uh, of people uh, giving the opinion it's gonna be a monoclonal antibody one day or the other. So this is the uh, landscape uh, as of today. So those are monoclonal antibodies that are unclinical trials for multiple myeloma. Um, and I highlight in red the ones who are um, further along in terms of development. Um, Elotuzumab uh, is, is perhaps the one that has the most advanced uh, uh, program at this point and targets CS1, which is an uh, interesting protein in the sense that it is uh, almost universally expressed in multiple myeloma, but not in normal plasma cells. And we're going to talk a lot about daratumumab and SARS-650984, which are directed at CD38. There are multiple other targets. Some of those targets are still, um, um, you know, uh, to be proven as uh, effective targets for multiple myeloma therapy. And I, I think it's, uh, if I have to, um, to uh, give an, a, a guess on uh, what's going to be the next target to be, uh, uh, to be uh, relevant, I would probably guess on the antibodies that target the PD-1, PD-L1 pathway. Of course, it's easy to be excited seeing what those antibodies have done in other diseases, including other hematological malignants. But I think uh, if you're trying to understand how those monoclonal antibodies are working in synergism with lenalidomide, it's impossible to uh, negate. There is a great component of that is by recruitment of, um, of, uh, uh, of, of immune system uh, functions such, such as ADCC. Uh, which are greatly enhanced by uh, blockage of PD-1 and PD-L1. So I think I really look forward to see uh, perhaps more than one monoclonal antibodies uh, combined in the near future. So just going to give a little bit of the data on elotuzumab. So this is a phase two trial. We're essentially aiming at comparing two different doses and picking the dose that go further in development. And this was recently updated as of last week, last year, sorry. So uh, 10 milligrams per kilo versus 20 milligrams per kilo. Um, and what we see here is the overall response rate of 84% with lotuzumab combined with lenalidomide uh, in low-dose dexamethasone. So this is a monoclonal antibody that as single agent has nearly zero uh, response rate. And then when you take a crowd of patients with relapsed multiple myeloma, many of which have received enlidomide before, you get an 84% response rate. So there's, uh, uh, there, I think that to me is near definitive proof that some of the mechanism how enlidomide works is by its not direct uh, uh, myeloma cell toxicity that we learned a lot about the last couple of years, but also by uh, enhancement of uh, of immune functions, uh, particularly ADCC uh, and NK-directed killing. Um, there was this uh, funky thing here that you see more responses in 10 milligram with 20 milligram. I don't think th that can be claimed with such a small sample size, but nevertheless, the company has gone forward uh, with the lower dose. Uh, 
So this is quite impressive. You can see that even the patients who uh, did not cross the barrier for 50% reduction on their markers, they still, almost everybody had a reduction in the AM protein. And uh, this is a toxicity profile, which is not very different from what we would expect with just lenalidomide and low-dose dexamethasone. So uh, moving on from the CS1 antibody to the anti-CD38 antibody, the one that's farther along in development is daratumumab. Um, and this is the single agent um, uh, phase two trial. Um, and as we can see here, is a, is a much more advanced population than we saw on the elotuzumab trial um, with 50% bortezomib uh, refractory patients, 75% LAN refractory patients, and 38% both bortezomib and lenalidomide refractory patients. So this is a very, very difficult uh, patient population. So this was a, a sequential cohorts with increasing dose and different ways to administer the drug, essentially uh, trying different uh, tricks to minimize what has been the main toxicity, which is infusion-related uh, uh, reactions. But when you come to looking at activity, so here you have what is being followed. It's the serum markers or urine marker, and then you see those um, you know, waterfall plots that we all have become used to see. And what you can see here, even this very, very difficult uh, population, um, the majority of patients have reduction in the M-spike, and about a third of them would meet, meet criteria for a, prog uh, for a partial response or better. And you can see here, this is the cohort with a higher dose and it becomes clear that there seems to be some uh, dose response effect here and as indeed the company is going forward with the higher dose 16 milligrams uh, per kilogram. Uh, again, um, when you use a lower dose, this is the response rate, but with the 16 milligrams you have a 35% response rate, which is um, not a small thing for a single agent monoclonal antibody in such an advanced uh, uh, patient population. So there are tumumab also has been combined with lenalidomide and dexamethasone um, in a phase two trial. So here's the uh, a scheme. Essentially, you get the traditional Lendex that we're all very used to, but then you get there a tumumab uh, weekly times eight, and then every other week um, uh, for the duration of the trial. Uh, so there is a part one that used lower dose in a more advanced patient population and the part two that used patients with one or more prior lines of therapy. And uh, here what you see, everybody responds on the part one and everybody got a reduction in their AM protein on the part two uh, with some patients, uh, with the vast majority of patients uh, meeting criteria for a PR. So when you look at all together, uh, you have, uh, you know, 86% uh, of response and 100% of in the part one. Um, and when you look at the GPR or better, you had uh, 65%, uh, which is, you know, quite incredible for a relapse uh, uh, patient. One thing that is interesting and again challenge how we assess disease, um, you know, daratumumab is a monoclonal IgG kappa antibody. And IgG kappa, of course, is the most common isotype of myeloma. Uh, so uh, this, the presence of the antibody itself can make immunofixation be positive, uh, which automatically make the patient no better than a VGPR. Uh, so this, the, the myeloma control indeed might be better than, you know, 60 70 percent of a GPR, uh, if you had a different way to measure, you probably would be uh, better than that. And in terms of toxicity, again, um, I would uh, uh, focus on the last column here. Uh, not very different from what we'd expect with uh, Lindex, with uh, essentially neutropenia being a common, si common uh, toxicity, but not very much in terms of infections, mostly asymptomatic neutropenia, because you don't have the GI toxicity that we usually uh, see with uh, chemotherapy agent. The uh, greatest, uh, because there's no much else in terms of other toxicities, the main thing is infusion re related uh, reactions. Um, and um, and I, I, I kind of tend to a little undermine this a little bit. I think anyone who has dealt with rituximab uh, is gonna find this uh, trivial uh, not to say laughable, I mean, this is not uh, by any means different from what we see with rituximab. Uh, it's more of a first infusion reaction. 
Uh, it tends to go away with subsequent infusions, and almost all patients can continue uh, with some management, the slowing down of infusions, and they have found that actually with some uh, extra hydration um, that can be greatly ameliorated. So I think there's going to be something that we're going to be talking about, but it's not uh, uh, by any means an uh, important barrier. A little bit behind in development, there's SAR650984, which is also a CD38 monoclonal antibody uh, made by Sanofi. Um, um, and uh, again, single agent activity in a very uh, pr uh, heavily treated uh, patient population. We see very similar figures, about a third of the patients have objective response. Uh, SAR also has been combined with a backbone lenalidomide and dexamethasone uh, in, in, in cohorts with, uh, with a crescent uh, dose up to 10 milligrams per kilogram. Um, and again, very heavily pretreated populations that almost everybody have received lenalidomide before, and many of those patients have received pomalidomide and carfilzomib, and it still gets 63% response rate. We've got to be careful not to compare the 63% response rate here from with 100% or 86% response rate with artumumab. Those are different trial designs, different patient populations. This is a more heavily pretreated patient's population, and these are certainly a small sample size to allow any sort of uh, cross comparison. Um, so I don't think at this point we can make any assumption in which uh, of the two is the best uh, anti-CD38 antibody. And last but not least, I'm going to talk a little bit about HDAC inhibitors. Um, and those are the HDAC inhibitors that have been tried or are being tried in multiple myeloma. And I have highlighted here the different uh, uh, histone deacetylase that are uh, thought to be most relevant uh, in multiple myeloma, uh, particularly HDAC6. And you can see here, uh, uh, penabinostat has one of the um, uh, you know, lowest IC50 um, compared, for example, with vorinostat that has undergone a large phase three trial, which was great, you know, essentially unsuccessful. Uh, but there's uh, promises on the line, like uh, ACY 1215 that has uh, a much lower uh, IC50 that uh, perhaps theoretically could be a better HDAC inhibitor. And the, the, the reason why HDAC inhibitors are being combined uh, with essentially bortezomib, um, we all know now that the reason why protosome inhibitors are thought to work in multiple myeloma is essentially by uh, blocking the degradation of the ubiquitinated protein and therefore uh, overwhelming uh, the, uh, the reticular endothelial system and causing um, uh, essentially a crisis that leads to apoptosis. The deacetylase um, um, uh, de is an alternative uh, a mechanism of processing the ubiquitinated proteins. Therefore, if that can be, you can have a dual blockage here. Uh, you cause, uh, you can precipitate ER stress response and lead to cell death. So it has some uh, interesting uh, background of why those two class of drugs should work together. And we're talking about this because of this large phase three trial that was uh, recently uh, published and has uh, uh, presented at ASCO, published subsequently, and generated a lot of controversy in the sense that this, got, this drug got a negative review uh, for an ODAC, but nevertheless was approved a couple of months ago uh, by the FDA. So the, the comparison here was uh, in relapsed patients between bortezomib, dexamethasone, and bortezomib, dexamethasone, and penobinostat. Um, and, um, and I find this, uh, if, we, if, we, if we, you know, the, the one of us, uh, those among us who have dealt with the 75-year-olds that come to clinic with multiple myeloma and have uh, um, some uh, challenges on managing medications. Uh, this is not a very user-friendly regimen. I mean, you have bortezomib twice a week. You have a lot of doses of dexamethasone. This is, you know, 80 milligrams a week, which you know can be quite toxic. And then you have ponobinostat three times a week. So your life is like Monday, take ponobinostat, go to the doctor's office, get the bortezomib, Tuesday, uh, you have a break, for, you know, Wednesday, ponobinostat, Thursday, bortezomib, Friday, ponobinostat. This can get confusing. I mean, uh, that's, and I think that's not a small thing to keep in mind when you go about using this drug. Uh, but this is the primary endpoint progression for survival. 
um, was uh, uh, better on the, uh, on, the, on the triplet than it was on the placebo, bortezomib, and dexamethasone uh, by about four months, 12 uh, time, uh, versus 8.1 months. That's in contrast with uh, one and a half month difference that we had seen on the Vorinostat trial, which was a positive trial, but uh, the drug essentially never made. Uh, when you look at overall survival, there was no different. One thing that is important when you look at toxicity, there was substantially more diarrhea, more fatigue, nausea, uh, reduced appetite, and quite a bit more of uh, thrombocytopenia. Uh, most of the thrombocytopenia was reversible, was cyclic, like we see with chemotherapy agents, uh, but nevertheless, uh, to me, um, it raises the question if that's going to impair uh, marrow reserve that could affect the use of subsequent lines of therapy. So this is my uh, overly ambitious uh, um, uh, intent to, uh, uh, as I look forward, what I think we're going to see in the next 10 years that could be paradigm changes in multiple myeloma. I think the monoclonal antibodies are uh, uh, for sure the, the most exciting news we have had since the you know, first proteasome inhibition I was, inhibitor, I would say. Um, and this is an easy uh, class of drug to combine with already existing uh, uh, backbone regimens. So I think over time we're going to see monoclonal antibodies of different types and different combinations permeate essentially every line of therapy. I think we're going to see uh, a pro a new proteasome inhib uh, inhibitors gradually replace bortezomib either for greater convenience or greater, uh, greater efficacy. We just a couple of weeks, uh, weeks ago uh, received the news from the favorite uh, 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 outlet of scientific communication, which is the press release um, that uh, the first head-to-head uh, 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 -head comparison between uh, carfizomib and bortezomib uh, has turned positive on an entering analysis for progression-free survival. That was for VD versus KD for um, relapsed patients at the Endeavor trial. So I think we, over time we're going to uh, see that more and more. And there are other proteasome inhibitors in the way, um, uh, exazomib, and, um, and the, there's an oro um, um, proteasome inhibitor for an onyx as well. I'm blanking on the name right now. Uh, we didn't talk at all about MRD, um, but it's uh, perhaps the second uh, hottest buzzword in multiple myeloma right now. It's very clear that um, MRD, by whatever methodology you, uh, you choose, uh, flow cytoma seems to be the most reproducible, the most likely to gain widespread use, is highly predictive of uh, relapse and can really help us sort out patients who have uh, CR uh, or VGPR amongst the ones who are going to um, are more likely or less likely to relapse. Uh, the challenge, of course, every time you have a new tool, a new diagnostic tool, is how to use it and how we're going to use that to stratify uh, treatment or base therapy. We have, I think, learned by looking at aggregate data that continuation of therapy is better than fixed duration therapy. Um, uh, and that argument only goes so far with a patient that I saw this week in clinic who I followed for seven years, had symptomatic multiple myeloma, anemia, M spike of three grams, got induction, got a transplant, got only PR, was very disappointed, and we decided to, choose, to follow him. And for seven years, he has an M spike of now about 1.2, and no anemia, completely asymptomatic. So uh, it's not clear that you know, continuation of therapy might be better than fixed duration therapy for everybody. MRD might be better, MRD negative is probably better than MRD positive, but we gotta be, do better than that. We gotta understand uh, for which patient that information is relevant, and most important, how to act uh, upon that uh, information to uh, choose therapy for patients. And that's what essentially what I meant by biological guidance and the duration of therapy. Last but not least, I just want to flash the list of trials that we have at, at UAB uh, for multiple myeloma. Uh, as uh, Dr. Ines Shelton mentioned, we have, uh, uh, and the ones before me have assembled an outstanding team of both uh, clinical investigators and laboratory uh, uh, based investigators in multiple myeloma at the UAB, and we're very proud of it. And we think we have a, a bright future ahead, and we hope to be able to collaborate.
uh, with different uh, institutions throughout the state and certainly uh, with Mitchell to improve outcomes for myeloma for all uh, in Alabama and surrounding states. But those are the trials we have currently. We have two phase three trials for newly diagnosed patients, one for a, po a population that is not uh, transplant eligible, which is essentially an uh, LD with placebo versus exazomib. We have the early versus delayed transplant trial that Dr. Uh, Shelton mentioned, uh, also an upfront phase three. Uh, we recently uh, had uh, v uh, opened the VD versus VD plus daratumumab for relapsed patients, a randomized phase two. I was very fortunate to bring this trial that was more than halfway uh, completed uh, and, uh, at MUSC, and uh, we're about to reactivate this trial. So this trial is an uh, invest uh, investigator-sponsored trial. We work the, the best dose of carfilzomib to combine with melphalanin conditioning a regimen followed by carfilzomib maintenance therapy, and now we're in the expanded cohort. So this is transplant for relapsed patients, other patients who had a first transplant and then relapsed or patients who did not get a transplant up front for whatever reason, but can get a transplant at the time of relapse. We have a trial with the RA520, a single agent um, for relapsed patients. Uh, very soon we're gonna have a phase one with carfilzomib and another uh, exciting uh, class of agents with this is an AKT uh, inhibitor uh, for Azertib. Um, and we uh, were collaborating with the Mayo Clinic to have a maintenance uh, trial um, essentially trying to improve on the results that are currently obtained with lenalidomide in that setting, and that's the lenalidomide plus LD225, which is a hedgehog pathway inhibitor. Uh, thank you very much for your time, your attention. Again, I went over time a little bit. I want to uh, flash my contact, and I'll be more um, than happy to uh, be of any assistance to uh, you if you can, or just chat about cases anytime you want. Thank you very much.